Thank you very much. Thank you for being here for another of our Living History programs to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the assassination. As Nicola mentioned, we're less than two weeks away, and this is an extraordinary moment to reflect back on that tragedy with uh, the closest civilian eyewitnesses to the uh, moment of the fatal shot. One of my jobs at the museum uh, is to manage our ongoing oral history project. As Nicola mentioned, it's a dynamic and ongoing initiative that's captured uh, close to 1,200 recollections from people around the world. We believe everybody has a story worth sharing, no matter where you were at the time. If you have memories of President Kennedy or the history and culture of the 1960s, I hope you'll contact us via our website, jfk.org, and we can set up an appointment, and you too can be part of this tapestry of living history at the museum. Uh, our guests today, of course, uh, really need no introduction. The Newman family were on the north side of Elm Street at the moment of the assassination. Uh, Bill, Gail, and their two sons, Billy and Clayton, who were ages uh, four and two at the time of the assassination. Uh, Bill and Gail have been at the museum many times in the past. I've shared this stage with them, and, and it's always fascinating to hear these eyewitness accounts of the assassination, but today, uh, is extra special. This is the first time that the Newman family, all four of them, have ever been together on a stage to talk about the assassination. And I learned yesterday, this is actually the first time as a family that they've ever discussed the assassination just between them. Uh, so we are going to be privy to a very unique and private conversation today. And I hope you'll join me in welcoming the Newman family to share their story. Gail, we're looking at a picture of the family from 1963. Uh, tell us a little bit about these folks and, and who they were 50 years ago. Well, they were my precious children and my wonderful husband. Uh, <laughs> Billy was uh, four years old and Clayton was two. Uh, the morning that the president was coming to town, we got up and got dressed in our Sunday best clothes and uh, went uh, to see him. This picture that you're seeing was taken about two weeks after the assassination and we're in our Sunday best clothes again. <laughs> you, uh, you didn't go to Dealey Plaza at first. Bill, your, your day started before that. Tell me about it. Uh, well, our original plans was to go out to Love Field and see President Kennedy and Mrs. Kennedy come in. We'd been watching on, on TV earlier and uh, when we got to Love Field there was a large crowd of people and I was able to get up to the fence. Uh, I believe I had Clayton in my arms and got a real good view of President Kennedy and Mrs. Kennedy as they passed by. But Gail was two or three people deep behind where we were standing and did not see uh, either one of them very well. The parade route had been published in the paper and so we knew the parade route and we jumped in our car and tried to get ahead of the uh, the parade. Before we continue the story, I want to turn to Billy. You were four years old at the time, but uh, you do have a little bit of recollection of, of Love Field. Tell me what you remember from that morning. I remember that morning getting up and getting dressed and going to Love Field and we were going to see the president. And, and I remember just there were lots and lots of people. Uh, did you have any awareness of who John F. Kennedy was at that time? I don't believe I did. I mean, I knew he was the president, but I don't know that that meant anything to me. Now, what was the, the purpose of going out that day? Was it for the two of you to see the president, or was it to provide your children with the opportunity, or a little of both? Well, I, I think it was really for our children. Of course, it was for Gail and myself also. We were very young ourselves at the time, and it's not every day that the president of the United States comes to your city. And I had I was off from work, and I just wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to see President Kennedy and, and Mrs. Kennedy because uh, as all of us here that's old enough know uh, uh, he was a very popular popular man at the time. So you knew the parade route, you jumped in your car, tell me where you went. Well we uh, came down very close to where we are now parked uh, uh, in behind this building and up over one or two buildings and uh, we walked down to the uh, corner of Houston and, and Elm and there was a large crowd of people. So we just started walking down the north side of the Elm Street and fell in beside the last uh, two people along the way uh, 
between Houston Street and the triple underpass. I remember as two women, one of them at the time seemed like an older person. She was probably about 25 years younger than what I am now, but uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I can remember the distinction between the two of them. Now, of course, most of the eyewitnesses in Dealey Plaza are well known to us. Did, did any of you notice anyone in particular that day as you were standing out there on Elm Street that, that stands out in your mind? I, I remember seeing Mr. Sapruder, if you were addressing that to me. Uh, he was standing back behind us uh, and uh, at an elevated um, uh, height. And at the time, I thought it was... Uh, O.L. Nims, a local uh, person here that uh, uh, I wouldn't call him a celebrity, but he was kind of a flamboyant person, and I thought that's who was standing back there. Okay. And, of course, I know that you later uh, learned who it was, Abraham Zapruder. Yes. And, Gail, there's an interesting connection to Abraham Zapruder that we'll hopefully get to a little bit later okay. in the program. The picture we're looking at is a, a picture which many of you might recognize taken by an eyewitness named... Uh, uh, Phil Willis, and I'm going to highlight the Newman family. There you see them there. Uh, Mr. Willis instinctively snapped this picture at the moment he heard the first shot. So it gives us a unique perspective of not just the presidential motorcade, but uh, the grassy knoll on the north side of Elm Street. Uh, Gail, the family had a unique connection to the parade that day. Uh, tell us about that. Uh, my uncle, Steve Ellis, was a motorcycle officer and he was leading the parade uh, through through the, uh, downtown. And uh, the children knew that he was gonna be riding by, so uh, when I saw him turn the corner and come towards us, I leaned down and I said, oh, there's Uncle Steve, let's wave. And, and I'm sure that we all hollered his name and, and waved to him. And uh, Uncle Steve was an unusual person. He didn't show a whole lot of emotions and uh, you know he probably just sort of nodded at us and <laughs> went on. Well of course we want to talk about those moments that followed. Um, the three of you on this panel have actual memories of, of the shooting. Clayton, uh, being age two, you don't actually remember the no. assassination but we're going to come to you a little bit later to talk about what this event means to you today. Uh, Bill, you've done hundreds of interviews over the years, been asked to tell this story time and time again. I'm going to ask you to tell it one more time for us today. Walk me through those moments. Just one more. Just one more, and that's uh, it. <laughs> okay. That's my promise. Okay. Uh, well, we, when we arrived uh, uh, to the location on Elm Street, we'd probably been there five minutes or less, and you could hear the parade coming down uh, Main Street. You could hear the cheering of the, of the crowd, and and I can recall uh, pre the president turning right onto Houston Street, the car going that short block to Elm and turning, turning back left on Elm. And as he was coming towards us, he was not against the curb uh, lane, as we all know, he was in the center lane. And as he was coming towards us, probably 75 or 100 feet from us, uh, the first two shots rang out. And it was, uh, bang, bang, something like that. And actually, I thought someone had thrown a couple of firecrackers beside the president's car. And I, and I can recall uh, him coming up in the seat, his arms coming up like that. And at the time, I testified that day that uh, he actually stood up in his seat, which in reality, he just brought his arms up. And as the car got closer to us, you could tell something was wrong. I could see the president kind of turning in his head into the crowd, and you could see Governor Connolly and his protruding eyes and the blood on his shirt. And just as the car passed in front of us, and he was maybe straight out as far as from here to the second row of seats, uh, and the third shot rang out. And I side of his head, and, and at the time I thought his ear blew off, the side of his head blew off and the white matter flew up in the red and I turned to Gail and I said, that's it, hit the ground. And we turned around, took our two children and pushed them over on the grass and, and fell down on top of them. Uh, not in a setting like this, but in my friends and stuff, I say, 
we actually broke and ran to get out of there and knocked our children down. But uh, <laughs> but that, that but that's that's not actually true. <laughs> but uh, then I can I can remember looking back and of course seeing the Secret Service man run towards the car and I thought that. I thought Mrs. Kennedy was trying to get out of the car, and which I found out years later, she was reaching back and picking up a piece of President Kennedy's skull, and uh, and the car shot on off and went on the triple underpass, and uh, that's that's basically it. Now you heard Mrs. Kennedy say something. I did. I heard her say, "Oh my God, no! They shot Jack." And uh, I recall that. And another thing that I that I recall uh, that's a little bit questionable, but I, I still have it in my mind. You know, it's said that the Secret Service man all stayed on the vehicle. And I remember, and it may have not been the car directly behind; it may have been the other car. But I remember, it seemed like they fly flipped back the cover that was over like the top and came out with something like Thompson submachine gun. And in my mind, one or two of them ran up the grassy knoll with that in their hand. Now, I don't know, you know, I try to tell people what I recall that day. And I've, I've been corrected on that statement in the past, but, uh, but that's, that's what I, re I recall happening. And it seemed like all of the crowd was running that way. The people that were nearby us ran up on the top side of the grassy knoll. And as I stated earlier, the uh, first two shots, I didn't even recognize as gunfire. And, but the third shot, I recognized as gunfire, most certainly. And I thought that shot was coming from behind. Gail, you walk us through those those moments as well. I know your story is, is similar to Bill's, but we want to hear your perspective as well. Okay. Uh, we, we were watching the president come towards us, and we heard two loud noises. And I thought it was firecrackers, as Bill did. And the president sort of threw his hands up, and I thought, boy, he has a good sense of humor because that's that's very bad taste to do something like that. I'd never been around gunfire before, so I, uh, I didn't know what it was. And uh, as they approached and got directly in front of us, that third shot rang out, and you could just see bits of flesh flying up and white matter, and uh, it was just terrifying to see. Uh, Bill told us, he said, that's it, hit the ground, and we put the children on the ground and shielded them with our body because from what we saw, the way he fell over into Mrs. Kennedy's lap, we thought that the shots were coming directly over our head. Uh, we didn't, I can't tell you that I even heard that third shot. Uh, I just saw, and uh, we were afraid that, uh, you know, they were coming over our head, and I saw men running up the hill with, uh, with guns also, and I, I was afraid that we might get in a crossfire. I was scared to death for my children. I was scared for Bill. I didn't think of myself. I was just thinking of my family. Billy, yours is a perspective we've not heard before. What, what stands out? What memories do you have as a four-year-old from Dealey Plaza? Well, I, I remember walking down uh, to, to where we stand. I remember walking down there. I do remember um, seeing people rush up uh, the little hill. I, I do remember that. Uh, but the one thing that I really do remember is uh, 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 a couple of men came and stopped us, and they flagged down a car, and uh, we all jumped into a car. And I don't know where we went, but I, I mean, I know we went to WFAA. But I, I, I do remember, and, and the thing that kind of still sticks with me is that was a stranger's car, and you're not supposed to get in stranger's cars. <laughs> Now, of course, the, the pictures of the four of you on the, on the grass in Dealey Plaza have become some of the most iconic images from, from the moments uh, following the assassination. I want to ask the two of you what it means to you to see these pictures of, of your parents shielding you with their bodies after the assassination. You know, I, I don't know that I've thought of it 
you know, any deep terms, you know. I'm glad they shielded me and protected me as you would expect parents to, to do for you. I mean, I would do the same for my kids, so. Does it mean something different today now that, uh, now that you have kids? Well, I mean, I definitely would probably do the same thing, you know, cover my kids and put them in the best situation I could. So. Billy, do you remember how long it was after the assassination that you saw one of these photographs of your family on the grass? Um, the first, uh, well, they were in the paper the next day and things like that, but I, I don't remember that. I remember um, a book, Four Days in Dallas, I believe it's called, and that's the book that you know I can remember looking at. I don't remember how old I was. But it actually, it, it actually bothers me looking at the books, right? My bad situation and our parents, you know, we were in danger. Gail, you've told me a story before about Billy coming to you in the days after the assassination. Tell me about what he asked you. A few days after the assassination, he came and climbed up in my lap and he said, Mama, he said, did you see all that blood? And uh, why did they shoot that man? And uh, he said, there was a lot of blood. And I told him that there was bad people in the world and that he was safe and people do bad things, but, but nobody was going to hurt him. And he, he seemed to, to absorb that and uh, agree with me. Do you remember that at all, Billy? No, she, she's told me about that, and I, I, don't, I don't remember it. But you do remember getting in a car and going to WFAA, and that's the next stop on the story. Uh, Bill, pick it up. You're, before we do that, though, there are, there's some news footage of you in the plaza before you get up off the ground, and you are pounding your fist into the grass. Tell us about that. You sure you want to hear that? I do. <laughs> I, I said, some son of a bitch just shot the president. That's, that's what I said. I mean, that's just a reactionary thing. How long were you on the ground? We, we, you know, it seems like we were there for a long time, but I'm going to say we were probably on the ground for two or three minutes, something like that. Uh, when you look at all those still photographs and there's nobody around us, it looks like we're down there for an excessive amount of time, but it was really, in reality, a very short period of time. And a lot of people will say, well, where was everybody at? Well, I'll assure you there were a lot of people around there, you know, uh, moments before the shots were fired, but people just scattered, you know, just right after it. Gail, with all of these photographers rushing around you, getting in your face, taking your picture, what was going through your mind? You're there covering your kids, and there's these men pointing cameras at your face. I couldn't figure out what they were doing. I mean, I knew they were taking pictures of them, but I thought they were all idiots because they were, didn't they realize they were fixing to get shot? <laughs> <laughs> well, pick up the story, Bill, and get us over to uh, WFA Channel all right. 8. All right. uh, two men, uh, uh, like just was stated, walked up to us, and one of them was Jerry Haynes. He was a local celebrity, Mr. Pepperman, if some people here are old enough to remember him. And then the other man, was that Jay Watson, Gail? Was it Jay Watson was the other man. And they asked us what we saw, and we told them to the best of our ability what we witnessed. And they asked us, said, would you mind going to WFAA? And uh, we started walking in that direction. And I don't actually recall if it was Main Street or Commerce. Uh, do you recall the street, Gail? I think it was Main. Main. Mm -hmm. uh, they stopped a the car, the, the traffic was just kind of at a standstill, and said, would you carry us uh, to WFAA? These people just witnessed uh, the president being shot. And uh, of course he said no, and uh, no problem, and drove us over there and dropped us off. And we went inside, and, and of course someone there asked us what happened, and we told them, and, and then the news came in that the president had been shot through the back and that he was at Parkland Hospital and was still alive, which, which dumbfounded me, you know, after what I just witnessed. But uh, there was a time period, 10 or 15 minute time period before they put us live on the air uh, waiting for confirmation or clearance to actually do that. Well, you know we're gonna take a look at that footage. I wished you wouldn't, but, it, but uh, I know I know you don't like that. Do you want to preface it? I always give you the chance to preface uh, showing this uh, particular clip. 
Well, you got to understand, Stephen, I was kind of in shock, and I don't really sound that way, but uh, you, 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 you go ahead and have your fun. <laughs> well, we're going we're gonna to take a look now at uh, this clip from the museum's WFA TV collection, and it is, it's the Newmans, all four of them. Uh, they were the first eyewitnesses to be interviewed live on television. We're going to take a quick, quick glimpse at this and then talk a little bit about it. And you will excuse me, I don't want to interrupt you. I, I'm so sorry because I know that you are so upset, but I would like to talk to you for a minute. It's a little bit awkward, so the camera shots will have to fall as they may. I'm going to stand right here and maybe somebody can give me a chair while we're doing this. May I have your name, please, sir? Bill Newman. And this is Mrs. Newman? Yes, sir. And this is? James Clayton. James, and this is? Billy. Billy, tell me what you saw and what you felt. What happened to you? We were, we had just come from Love Field after seeing the president and the first lady and we were just in front of the triple underpass on elm street and we we're at the edge of the curve getting ready to wave at the president so you I, were down uh, you were down under the viaduct so to speak weren't you well we were halfway in between uh, on the grass the triple under, underpass we were at the curve when an incident happened but the president's car was some 50 feet still yet in front uh, of you in front of us coming towards us and we heard the first shot and the president, I don't know who was hit first, but the president jumped up in his seat and I thought it scared him. I thought it was a firecracker because he looked, you know, fair. And then as the car got directly in front of us, well, a gunshot apparently from behind us hit the president in the side, side of the temple. Did, did you, do you think the first gunshot came uh, from behind you too? I, I think it came from the same location. I, uh, apparently back up on the, the uh, uh, mall, I don't know. What you call it. For the benefit of nomenclature, all of you folks have gone out under the viaduct, and as you turn, going under the viaduct on the left-hand side, there's some grass. Uh, do you think the shot came from up on top of the viaduct toward the president? Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, not, no, not on the viaduct itself, but up on top of the hill, on a the little hill mound of, uh, of ground near the garden. How far away do you, would you say that is from where the president was? Uh, a couple of 300 yards, something like that? Well, I have no idea because I, I didn't see the... the where the gunshot come from, uh, we were looking directly at the president when he was hit. Mm -hmm. And he was more or less directly in front of us, and uh, we didn't realize what happened until we seen the side of his head uh, whenever the bullet hit him in the head. Did you see the blood coming from the, the president's head? Yes, sir, we seen that. I seen that. I don't know if my wife did, but I seen that. Oh, yes, know? sir, it was awful. It, it yeah. is awful. I saw it. What kind of work do you do, sir? I'm a construction worker, electrician. Is this the uh, is this the first time that uh, that you have seen a president of the United States? Did you see him when he was here before in 1961? No, sir. Uh -huh. no, sir. Uh, your housewife? Yes, sir. Took the day off to come downtown and see the president? Yes, sir. We did. We wanted our children to see it. Uh -huh. uh, were you in the line of fire? I noticed. I re I remember vividly whenever uh, I walked over and looked over the banister there and saw across the street. That you were down on the ground uh, so that uh, to keep out of the line of fire. What was the first thought that struck your mind? Oh, I, I thought it was a firecracker, and I saw the blood, and I, I had the baby, and I, I just ran, and we, I got on top of him and laid on the grass. I, I was, it just scared me. It was terrible. Did you see anyone else hit besides the? Uh, I, I'm, uh, Go Governor Conley was, was kind of oh, turned he he to the side, and he grabbed his stomach. stomach. There. The interview goes on for, for quite a bit longer, and then uh, Bill and Gail are, are interviewed separately, but this gives you a little glimpse of, of, of what that experience was like. Something that's always uh, occurred to uh, the museum staff here, Clayton, is throughout that entire sequence, you are fiddling with a pair of pliers. <laughs> and, and it has always bewildered us why a two-year-old had a pair of pliers. And, and we always assumed that it was just something that somebody from the TV station just gave you, you know, here's a two-year-old and with an early 1960s mentality, here are some pliers, you know, keep quiet. Uh, <laughs> But but yesterday uh, we sort of we were all t we were together and we were looking at some pictures and we stumbled across something interesting. If you look really closely at one of the close-up images of you on the on the north side of Elm Street, there you are holding those pliers during the assassination, <laughs> which uh -oh. has created an all new mystery. Uh, so I'll just I'll just throw it out there. Did any of you? have any idea why uh, why two-year-old Clayton was holding some pliers during the Kennedy assassination? I don't know. I mean, Clayton's always been mechanical. <laughs> so, I mean, that's... Uh, 
That would be my only response because it was yesterday that I found out about the flyers. It, it just goes to show you that even half a century later, we are still uncovering new information. It, it's, it's really remarkable. Now, 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 Billy, do you have any memory of being at Channel 8 and being under those studio lights? <laughs> I remember they took us off camera and fed me. <laughs> They, they did. Uh, Gail, they, they interrupted the Julie Bennell program and, uh, and tell us what you had for what she tried to give you to eat. Okay. Uh, uh, Julie Bennell was a very popular program. I watched it every day because I was learning how to cook. <laughs> uh, she was cooking a, a Harmel Cure 81 ham, which was a boneless ham, which was new on the market. And uh, they took us over into her studio and sat down, and she fixed the boys both a ham sandwich. <laughs> and uh, I think Billy remembers it well. well. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me, let me ask uh, Billy and Clayton a question. You know, this footage, of course, has been used in a number of documentaries. It's been seen uh, quite often over the years. What does it mean to you today, uh, now that you're both in your early 50s, to look back and see yourselves at ages two and four? I could talk. <laughs> you could say your name. Yeah, yeah. Billy. Okay. Does it, does it mean something special when you, when you reflect upon this at the 50th anniversary? I, it, I don't know that it's anything special to me. Uh, um, Just another day in your life? Yeah. I mean, people, people see it and then they find out that that's me and people want to talk about it, but it doesn't mean anything to me. Hmm. Clayton, we're going to talk about this in a, in a, in a few minutes, but, but tell us when you had your first realization that your family and you were a witness to the assassination. Yeah, I've been thinking about that. I think the first thing I can remember is when I believe my mother had gone off to um, a trial in New Orleans, and um, I couldn't have been very old then either. The Clay Shaw trial with yeah, DA uh, Jim Garrison. Okay. Yeah, so that was probably the first time I remember just because she was gone, and I think they explained to me why she was gone. I don't know, maybe I was six or eight years old at that time. And, um, and then I also remember looking through the, the book, Four Days in Dallas. Is that, was it Four Days that we had? I used to look at that quite a bit when I was young. Okay. We'll come back to that. But uh, Bill, wrap the story up for us because your day didn't end at WFAA. It just went on and on into the night. Well, it, it did. Uh, after the own uh, uh, camera interview, I had a short interview on the radio station there, and after that was finished, there was two uh, sheriff's deputies from Bill Decker's office waiting for us, and they carried us over uh, to the sheriff's department, and uh, Gail and myself gave affidavits, and I think we were two of 16, I think I'm correct in that, I'm not positive, that day, that shortly after the assassination, that gave affidavits. And then they carried us in a conference room, all of us, and uh, we just sat there and found out later the purpose of keeping us over, which we stayed there, I think, till about 9 o'clock at night, was that someone, probably the FBI, someone was reviewing each one of these statements and seeing if there were any conflict in the statements or if they wanted to re-interview us uh, for whatever purpose. And uh, that's, uh, that's primarily, primarily what happened to us. I mean, we just spent the rest of the afternoon and part of the night in Sheriff Bill Decker's hotel, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, they did, I think, feed us bologna sandwiches at one that time. That olive loaf. Olive loaf? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, <laughs> Now, Gail, I imagine it was tough keeping up with two kids, two and four, at the uh, sheriff's office. Did anything interesting happen? Well, um, let me scoot over from Clayton a little bit. <laughs> uh, I was potty training Clayton at that time. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he realized that every time that he, we had to go to the bathroom, that they'd have to send a uh, a deputy over to escort us to the bathroom. So the little devil uh, decided that he needed to go to the bathroom about every five minutes. 
So I called my dad, yeah. and uh, he finally came and picked both the boys up about 6.30. And uh, then after we were released, uh, we went by and picked them up. It's, it's interesting looking at the WFA footage to realize just how young all of you were, all of you especially. Uh, now, you were concerned, you were afraid, Bill, and, and you took some precautions that night. Tell us what you did to protect your family. I'm a little embarrassed to say this, <laughs> but uh, we, we all stayed in the same bedroom, and I had an old 20-gauge shotgun, an old bolt-action 20-gauge shotgun, and I, I loaded it and laid it down beside the, the bed because I, I thought we might be able to testify against someone or pick someone out of a lineup, and uh, I had some fear that, uh, you know, that uh, we could be harmed. Looking back on that, you know, thinking of somebody capable of killing the President of the United States, they wouldn't have a whole lot of trouble of killing us if they so chose. Uh, but uh, for a week or two, I did have that concern. But I will say this, Stephen, you hear stories about people being intimidated or harmed in some way because of being part of this story. Never were we ever intimidated or harmed by anybody. So I, I always like to stress that because uh, I've heard quite a few stories that people come up with and maybe they're true and maybe they're not, I don't know. But at no time have I ever felt, uh, you know, intimidated. Now, Bill, your statements to WFAA have often classified you as uh, grassy knoll eyewitnesses, uh, those who felt a shot came from the grassy knoll. Here at the Half Century, set the record straight for us. Where do you think the shots came from? Well, uh, I, I, I do not know the path uh, of the shot. It was the visual impact when President Kennedy was hit, that he went back and across towards Mrs. Kennedy, more or less into her lap. And at that moment, I had the sensation that the shot was coming directly over the top of our heads. Many people who interview us want to find, they ask us to elaborate. And a lot of times when they're filming us or taking photographs, if they believe a shot came from the picket fence, they they consider that as behind. If they think the shot came, all the shots came from the sixth floor, they'll take our picture with the school book depository in the background. And I'm saying the shot came from behind. But the reality of it is, I have no idea of the actual flight of the of the projectile, the bullet. Uh, only, only that visual impact that it had on me to see in the way the President Kennedy reacted to the shot gave me that sensation. And in reality, and we were focused, or I was focused, from the time the car turned on Elm Street. My, I had more or less tunnel vision on the car. So you know, as far as any other directions or any other things going around me. Uh, I can't help you. Now, I do want to ask this of all four of you. I, have, I already have about 25 questions that have been submitted. If you do have questions for the Newmans, it, it, we won't be able to get through all of them, but if you'll pass those to the end of the rows, we'll collect those in just a moment here. But, but just in looking through this initial stack, the same question comes up over and over and over again. What do you believe? Do you believe that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone gunman, or do you believe in a conspiracy? So I want to just ask each of you, because I know there's some disagreement here. So I want to just go down the line and just tell me what you believe. Bill? Well, where do you think the disagreement is? Uh, <laughs> right here? We'll see as we get down the line. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, uh, 50 years have gone by, and I, I have listened to a lot of people's uh, theories. And, and one thing I don't do, I don't try to dispute anybody and I don't try to belittle anybody because these research type people, many of them have given up their jobs and, and have spent years and years to solve uh, the assassination of President Kennedy. Uh, 
So I respect the people uh, for their efforts. And to be truthful with you, I could take either position very easily that Lee Harvey Oswald fired three shots from the sixth floor window and acted totally alone. But by the same token, I could take the position very easily that there was somebody else involved. And if you say, well, you're riding the fence, which way would you go? I will always want to believe there is a possibility that someone else could have been involved, evolved. Whether it was more than one shooter at the site, which I have no way of knowing, or whether there was somebody else in the background. If there was somebody else in the background, you could call that a conspiracy. So the idea of a conspiracy will probably never in my lifetime be totally removed from my mind. But I can see where any individual who studies assassination could very easily take either position. Is that good enough? That's fine with me. <laughs> well, I, I, as promised, let's, let's go down the line. Gail, what do you believe today, 50 years later? It's hard for me to believe that one person planned all of it out and was at the right place at the right time and everything, but if there was somebody else involved in it, they couldn't keep it quiet. They'd have to blab about it, you know. Uh, so uh, I don't know. Billy? Uh, from what I've read and what I've seen and what I've heard, it's just very hard for me to believe that a single person um, did what history says he did. And Clayton? I'm going with the, he was the only one. Okay. So the two boys See? disagree there. That's interesting. We're, we're here at the half century mark, of course, and I want to ask Billy and, and Clayton, we were talking a little bit about this yesterday. The two of you are part of an elite group, the children of Dealey Plaza, Tina Towner, Ricky Chisholm, there's others, but, but there will come a time when one or both of you will be our last direct links to the Kennedy assassination because you were there. Do you feel, now that you're adults, uh, the burden of history? I don't know that I feel a burden of history. I mean, I, I understand we were there and I understand what's going on at some point. Hopefully we'll be survivors and make it to the end. <laughs> <laughs> I was the youngest, so I hope I make it the, the longest. So. <laughs> I'm gonna go with the order of life. Not so quick. <laughs> so, what about you, Billy? I'm hurry. I've seen my, people, my um, father and mother be very generous to researchers and people and people with inquiring minds. And, and there's always the thirst for knowledge and to learn. And uh, I've actually thought that there's going to be a day that the phone rings and they're actually looking for me instead of trying to find my dad. I mean, in October, November of every year, I get quite a few phone calls, you know, looking for my dad. And at some point in time, I believe that there's going to be people reaching out asking me, you know, what did I see, what I know, what have I learned? Doesn't sound too good for me, does it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because today I just give them your home phone number or cell number and I'm done. Now, now, Bill and Gail, you have been very generous with your time over the years, not just to this museum, but to researchers and, and reporters around the world. You've traveled to London and, and all over to share your story time and time again. Are you tired of it? After 50 years, are you tired of the Kennedy assassination? Well, um, I, I know the story pretty well. I mean, you, you know, I, it's, it's the same old stuff. Because we try to stay, I think both of us try to stay on, on course as to what we saw that day, you know. And, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll always be willing to give interviews. I mean, if, if it's a school history class or a civic organization or the sixth floor museum, I'm, I'll always be available if and when I can, you know, for a, something like that. 
because I have recognized that we are part of history, even though we're just a small part. Wes Wise one time was interviewing us, and he was a past mayor, as you know, of Dallas, and had been a sportscaster in Dallas. And, and I asked him, I said, why does this just keep going on and on and on, you know? Uh, why do people, why don't they just let it rest? And he said, oh, Bill, people will be uh, calling you the rest of your life. He said, people are still researching the uh, Lincoln assassination. So uh, I accept that, and when I can, well, I try to cooperate with people. I want to get to a few of our audience questions. Um, this one is not addressed to any one of you in particular, so anyone can answer. Uh, how long after the assassination did, did you view the Zapruder film, and, and did it change what you thought you saw in Dealey Plaza? Well, you know, it, was a long, it, was, it seemed like it was a long time before I saw it, Stephen. I can't actually give you a date. Uh, the, uh, the thing that did change was the statement that I gave uh, in my affidavit that President Kennedy came up out of his seat. When I, I did see the, see the fact that he did not do that, uh, that his uh, arms just came up. But... Uh, that's that's probably the the only significant thing that I can can recall. Mm -hmm. Any of the rest of you want to mention when you first saw the Zapruder film and and what that experience was like? I don't recall the first time that that I saw it. Uh, uh, we have a big family Thanksgiving dinner in the early years. Uh, we tortured everybody that made them look at interviews and and things like that. <laughs> And now here's another question. Uh, were you asked to testify for any of the official government investigations? There's an interesting answer here. Well, no, we, we, did, we did not uh, testify before the Warren Commission. We did give that affidavit the day of the assassination, and, and it was Sunday after that, three days after that, that uh, we were re-interviewed by the FBI. They came out to our home and the purpose in them coming out was to go over our affidavit and ask us if there were any changes we wanted to make or anything we wanted to add to it, which there was not. Now, Gail, it wasn't uh, an official government investigation, but we mentioned earlier the uh, Clay Shaw trial in New Orleans, and you have an interesting story that involves Abraham Zapruder, and I'd like you to share that if you would. Okay. Bill had the flu, so we weren't able to go down together, and uh, I flew into New Orleans, and I, it could have been my first time to fly, and uh, you'd have to realize that I was a scared little girl until probably five years ago, <laughs> but I learned to talk. But uh, we were called to testify in that, that trial, and uh, it was during Mardi, Mardi Gras, and things were pretty wild down there and, and so I stayed in my room most of the time and we got in uh, a police officer's car uh, to go back to the airport and Mr. and Mrs. Zapruder was with us and also one other witness, uh, I believe he was a postal worker and he, he happened to observe the assassination. And we were going through an intersection uh, and this tractor trailer truck ran a red light and the detective that was driving us, he said, boy, this would make headlines. <laughs> Three witnesses of the Kennedy assassination mowed down. <laughs> well, speaking of the New Orleans uh, trial, of course, you are portrayed by actors in Oliver Stone's film, JFK. This question is, what is it like to see actors portraying you in a movie? Weird. <laughs> just real, real exciting, uh, Stephen. Just real exciting. <laughs> now you got to uh, you got to meet Oliver Stone. Yes. What was that like? I'm not a fan of Oliver Stone, so I'll I, I'll pass. <laughs> I'll pass on that. Yeah, I, I was. I don't know. He he was kind of a turnoff for me. To be I honest, I think he was a chauvinistic pig. <laughs> <laughs> But Stephen, let me tell you one thing that's, that's happened out of this whole thing. 
I got to meet Kevin Costner. <laughs> Now, I brought up the JFK movie because there's an interesting little fact that I bet very few people in this audience know. Billy, you tried out right. to be your dad in the movie JFK. I obviously failed, but yes, I tried, I tried to be my dad. You didn't get the part, but you did audition for yes, it. Yes, I did. Okay. Well, we don't really have more time for questions. I do want to, at the end, just, just leave it with, with this thought, and, and, and I'll let each of you respond if you'd like. But does this particular anniversary have any special meaning for you, the half-century mark of the Kennedy assassination? Gail, let me ask you that first. It, it does have a little bit of meaning to me because uh, it's the first time that the four of us have been together in 50 years to be interviewed. Uh, you know, Bill lives here, so occasionally when someone's interviewing us, they include him, but uh, not Clayton. And I, I think that that's good because most people that talk to me want to know about my children. They want to know how it affected them or how they've turned out and uh, etc. cetera. Uh, I think that they've turned out as fine young men and I'm awfully proud of them. And, uh, we didn't get to go to any uh, therapy or anything like that. That wasn't available, I guess, back then. But we were so young, uh, we were just trying to make it day by day. And uh, we didn't dwell on it, and we still don't dwell on it. In fact, uh, as I told you yesterday, when you pointed out the pliers that Clayton was playing with, I had never seen it before. And uh, then last night I got on the computer and I watched the WFAA uh, series and I had just seen the first little bit of it. It goes for 15 minutes and they brought me back in and I was holding Clayton and they wanted to know what he was eating. He was eating candy. Uh, uh, it's just nothing that we dwell on. Bill, you've been interviewed more than anyone else on this stage, so I'm going to let you have the final word. Well, Stephen, it, it, it is, I guess, a significant number in the 50 years. One thing that I recognize, enough time has passed that we can openly talk about it and at the same time laugh and have a little humor. It's a very serious subject. and. There's no question in my mind that the assassination of President Kennedy put a very dark cloud over Dallas. It put a very dark cloud over Texas. Anywhere you'd go in the world, people would ask you, and should they ask you where you're from, and you'd say, I'm from Dallas, and they'd say, oh, that's where they killed Kennedy. But we're way past that now, but uh, it, you know, it's a very solemn event that took place in this country. And of course, I did not recognize at the time how significant it really was. Uh, President Kennedy had an impact on the entire world. And we've probably had more people from Europe interview us and from Australia and Japan than we have people stateside. I don't know what the fascination really was in the man, but uh, somehow he really drawn people to him. So uh, the 50th is more or less a time of relief or something for me, you know, it's not it's no longer something that's uh, as solemn to me as it once was. This has been an extraordinary conversation. Uh, the Newmans, uh, unfortunately, have another engagement right after this, and so they are not going to be able to take any personal questions or sign autographs. Uh, out of respect for them, as they leave the stage, we would ask everyone to keep your seats just for a moment. And uh, as, they, as they leave today, I hope you will join me in thanking this family for sharing their story. <laughs>